Good morning. So, uh, before we get started, who all found something? All right, what, what did we find? Somebody say what you found. Wallet, money. Wallet, money. A sock. Keys. Sunglass. Oh, remote. What else? Purse. Oh, a lighter. I didn't even have that one. <laughs> God's full of surprises. He's telling us to light our fire. No. Um, so this was the, the, a little, this is like part of my brain right here, so you guys understand. I'm a little kooky. So I started writing this sermon and trying to figure out the, what I'm trying to do these first few sermons. Like, like the last sermon was, hey, it, it's okay. God's in the change. Things are going to be okay. So that's sort of it. This sermon was about why. Why are we the church? Or why should we be the church? Or what, what are we even doing here? And, and so I thought about uh, the parable of the lost sheep. So out of the little kookiness of my mind, I'm like, I'm going to call the sermon, Where's My Sweater? And make everybody wonder what I'm talking about. Well, it's because there's my sweater. It's right there. Who found my sweater? Ah, somebody did find my sweater. So, so just as a little bit of an illustration... I thought it would be, it started with this little idea, I was going to hide one item and then tell everybody that to look for it, and I was going to see how everybody squandered to find it, and then then it just grew into this thing about, well, what do we spend time searching for when we're at home? It's always the remote. How many of you have tore the whole house up to find the remote besides just get up off the couch and go turn the channel? I know I've done that. All right, how many of you... You get ready to leave, and you got to be somewhere in 10 minutes, and you can't find your keys anywhere. <laughs> and then you're destroying everything, looking for your keys, and it turns out they're in your pocket, or for you ladies, in your purse. Uh, a funny thing happened yesterday. I'm getting this stuff together to hide it here, and I'm thinking about all the stuff I'm going to hide, and I had already put in a remote in Kara's purse. Now imagine me walking around the house with a purse anyway, I walked in here this morning with my purse, and uh, Danielle said, that the purse looks good with your outfit, and I'm like, you know, I tried to coordinate it, so no, um, but I had put a remote in the purse already, and then I started doing inventory in my mind, and I started looking for stuff, I couldn't find the remote, and I'm, I'm talking to Care, and I'm laughing, I'm like, this is the illustration exactly, because here I've, I've found it, and then I'm trying to find it, and I can't find it, guess where it was? In the purse already i just was flipping past i don't know how you ladies ever find anything and those it's like it's like the the it's like a void full of lies i promise there's so po- so many pockets and zippers and things i would i would lose i would i wouldn't be able to find anything so so that was the uh, the, the little illustration but there's a surprise that some of you have found and some of you have not so i, I thought this could be like an oprah moment there's six envelopes. How many, how many found an envelope already? Only two. So that means there's four more envelopes taped under your chair somewhere. And those envelopes have something else in them. Uh-oh, we got one in the back. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Ah, we've got one in the back. Another one in the back. You're going to tear the place up looking for it. If we don't find them right away, we can find them later. Free chicken dinner. So in those envelopes are $5 bills. And if you need those $5, you keep them. If you feel like you don't need them, find somebody that needs them and give it to them. Or buy somebody that's homeless a meal or, uh, or something with those $5 bills. All right, so the significance of all this stuff, this passage of Scripture that we're going to study, it ties together three or four places. There's, there's like, first it starts about the lost sheep, and then it talks about the lost coin, and then it talks about the lost son. And it's in, uh, it's in Luke chapter 15 is where it starts. This is generally called God's lost and found. So that's what this section, a lot of people call this section of the Bible where, where we're talking about God's lost and found. I want to focus a little bit on, on just the sheep this morning. 
The idea of the, the losing stuff and trying to find it is that generally, even things that we value very little, we put a lot of time into trying to find them. So remember that thought as we go through this. I mean, how many of you really value your remote control more than something else? Your family member or, or loved one. But if you lose that remote, man, that's all you can think about for a short period of time and it really gets you aggravated when you can't find it. So think about how much, we, how much time we spend looking for stuff that we value very little. And I want to contrast it with stuff that maybe we should value a lot is the point. Okay, let's start with prayer because that's the best place to start always. Father, we're so grateful this morning for your word. We're grateful for our laughter. We're grateful for fun. We're grateful for a chance to be here in your house. We're grateful for your spirit and how it rests on this place when we invite it here. We invite you here this morning, Lord, that you would take over the service, take over the words that are coming out of my mouth, take over the things that we think about, that it's your word, that it's your way, that it's your will. And I ask that you just be in control and that we learn from you, that we feel your presence, and that we are changed by it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's start. Luke 15, we're going to read 1 through 7. And we're going to see what we're trying to learn. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. That's a muttering. Everybody know how to mutter? <laughs> this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then it goes on to say, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and then go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully picks it up on his shoulders and goes home. Key words here. Look, look at joyfully. And the next should have a little bit more. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not, who do not need to repent. Let me get my words straight before I get all twisted. Okay, so we're going to set the stage here. What is a parable? Everybody knows what a parable is. Is it a true story? Not necessarily. We can use true stories as parables. Most of the time, Jesus told parables to make a point. Uh, he, this was one of his favorite teaching styles. He liked to take characters. He liked to to put people into situations and, and, and make them think about stuff that they don't normally think about. Uh, and, and this sort of parable, he's trying to make the Pharisees or religious people, he's trying to get their mindset off of their normal mindset. Right? So what we're setting the stage here is he's eating with sinners and tax collectors. I find that funny that Tax collector and sinner are synonymous in the Bible. <laughs> now, if you know any tax collectors, don't tell them I said that. But, but I find that funny. And why was that? Because people hated tax collectors. Uh, the reason why? is Because if you were a tax collector back then, the king would say, I, these people owe me $500. Whatever you get over that $500, you can keep. So the tax collectors would go tell the people, you owe me $1,000. And they would go pay the king 500 and they would get rich, line their pockets with everybody's money. Cheating, lying, dirty, rotten scoundrels. And yet Jesus ate with them. Now, let's change the parable a little bit here and get everybody's brain into what Jesus was doing to the Pharisees. Let's say you're walking, no, you're, you're, you hear Jesus is speaking down at the Bojangles Arena. And you go down to hear Jesus speak. There's a large crowd gathered. 
And he is sitting, eating when you get there with the Muslims and the homosexuals. And the, do I need to keep saying people other than normal everyday, whatever you can send those normal everyday people. And he's sitting there talking to those people. I can't believe that. Why would he associate with those people? Now, now you're feeling emotionally how the Pharisees felt emotionally about the conversation Jesus was about to have with them. Why would he speak to those people? Doesn't he know what those people do? And then Jesus starts to teach this parable. And the parable is, hey, wouldn't you, any of you, if you had a lost, a farmer that had a lost sheep, wouldn't he leave all the rest of the sheep and go to the one and try to find the one that's missing? You see what he's saying? He's telling them, it's not about you to the Pharisees. It's not about your religiousness. I don't care how religious you are. It's about the lost ones. It's about the ones out there that are not in here in the flock. So, the Pharisees didn't mind. Now here's the thing now, and this is where we Christians get the same misconception about how to love people that are different from us. The Pharisees didn't mind that Jesus was teaching the sinners and the tax collectors. They didn't mind that at all because they thought that was honorable. We should be teaching them. What he minded is that we, he was eating with them, socializing with them, coming down to their level because the Pharisees thought we're the religious people. And those people out there need to come hear what we have to say because we're the important ones. And Jesus was like, no, 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 no. These are the ones I came for. These are the ones that I love. So, First thing that happened to Jesus that we need to learn how to let it happen to us by letting His Spirit take us. He was moved by compassion. In this story, the shepherd was moved by compassion for what we would consider the unimportant things. He had 99 other sheep. You know, in our culture today, I don't even think we could connect well with this parable because we are the throwaway society. Man, you get it, you use it, and then you toss it. Because it's used up, it's done. I got 99 more at home. Well, this culture, they, they weren't like that. This culture, everything mattered. Anybody remember a grandparent? that they would save everything and reuse everything. It didn't matter what it was. You wash that out, you save it. I'm going to use it for this, that, or the other. And why were they like that? Because they went through World War II. And they went through a time when they didn't have abundance of everything. They went through a time where they had to hold on to every little thing they had, and everything that they had was important. And if it could be used... You bet they found a use for it. But the shepherd here was moved by compassion for the sole one lost sheep. The same way Jesus is trying to tell these Pharisees that all people matter to me. All types of people, all kinds of people, all races of people, all levels of people, all, all people. When you say all, it means what? All. all. And if there's not a more, a lesson that we need to learn today, in this day and age, is that all people matter to God, it is today. In light of what just happened, in light of what's been happening over these past months of, 
of all the shootings and hurtings and it's all driven by hate and it's wrong. It is wrong. That is not God. There's nowhere in the Bible God hates. Fill in the blank. Except for sin. But guess what there is about sin? Everybody's sin manifests a little bit different. You know, the real issue is sin, but the way it manifests in your life is different. So if you judge somebody because of how it manifests, then you're judging yourself. Right? The Bible doesn't say, uh, judge lest you be judged, judge not lest you be judged, or the way you forgive is the way you will be forgiven. So if you judge somebody, then you just judged yourself. Now, there is using good judgment. There's a difference. But, so he was moved by compassion because all people, all people matter to God. And the shepherd, all people, all the sheep matter to the shepherd. Even the one lowly sheep. Um... It's not about the healthy. It's about the sick. It's not about the ones that are already included. It's about the ones that are excluded. That's the, that's the principle of what this story and this parable is about and what Jesus was trying to get across to the Pharisees. It's not about all those that are already included or think they're included or think they're righteous, but it's about the ones out there that don't know me. It's about the ones out there that don't love me. And so here's the, here's the, here's the, the, the translation of, and I thought about this. You know, my daughter says this thing. She says, I don't sport. And I laugh at that because the way we use English language is funny. But I thought about maybe we should start using Christian as a verb. We should Christian. We should stop being Christian and we should start Christianing. And think about there for a second, because what does Christian mean? It means to be Christ-like. So we all should learn how to start Christianing. Right? And if we think about it like that, maybe we're going to get a little further than just identifying with like the Pharisees did. I'm religious. All right, so he was moved by compassion. What was the next step that the shepherd? He was compelled to action. He wasn't just moved by the fact that there's a missing sheep. It wasn't just, oh, okay. Well, I guess I guess I only have 99 now. I guess I have to rebuild with the 99. No, he was compelled. I've got to go find that one. I've got to go. Now, I don't know. I, I've still struggle to understand this one. I, I just don't get. You're going to leave 99 because you're worried about one. Does that make sense to anybody? That's God's math. And maybe it should make us think a little bit about the way we count. What's the win? Is, is the win... Uh, 500 people in a church service and, and a large offering, is that the win? Or is the win the one person that, that was looking for God and they found God? And I think God's telling us that's the win, even if it's for the one. And I didn't plan this as a sermon illustration, but it happened this week. I told the worship team this morning, I had this week off. Now, I'm going to start being here certain hours of the day. I'm going to set the schedule up. It's going to be online. It's going to be on the Facebook so people know when I'm here because I want to be here in case somebody strolls in off the street. And so I've been thinking about that. I've been talking about that, trying to figure out the schedule that I'm going to put to be here. And this past week, I was trying to get here to pick up my Kindle, which I had left here last week so I could work on sermons. And I couldn't get here. There was something else happened. I went to get oil changed. It took two hours. So then, then 
I was trying to find Tina a tire for her car that I called around. They had one in Monroe, so I had to go back home and get my car, then go down to Monroe. They didn't have the tire. So I'm running around all day, finally get here at a 3, 30, 4 o'clock. And instead of being able to spend some time here, I was only able to get in here and get my Kindle. So I walk in, I get my Kindle, I'm walking out, and there's a van parked out in the parking lot. I didn't recognize the van, and there's a lady walking out to the front of the, of the property taking a picture. And I'm like, I didn't know what was going on. So I walked up and asked her, hey, how's it going? I'm Marty, I'm the pastor, blah, 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 talking to her. Turns out she was trying to get information from the church because she had just lost her baby nephew that was like six weeks old. And so I invited her in. I showed her around the church, told her about the services, and she said she was going to try to come, but she works on, you know, at Food Line, and sometimes she works Sundays. And I had a chance to pray with somebody that was hurting. And it was a God thing because I would have already been here and gone had everything in my day worked out well. Right? But... As an illustration, God says it's about that one. You know, it was that one person. It was that one sheep. So he was compelled to action. He went out looking. He went out looking. Now, how does that translate to us? Intentionality. If, if there's one word that we can translate to us as being Christian or Christianing, we have to be intentional about going out. We have to be intentional. Maybe it's a prayer before you get up in the morning. Lord, if there's somebody at my work that I have walked past for three years that I haven't spoken to, that you're trying to, that you're touching their heart, that you're, lead them, lead me to them or lead them to me. We have to be intentional. We have to int pray intentionally. We have to think intentionally. I, God is about the lost sheep. I need to be about the lost sheep. Here's the next thing that we get from this passage. He was uh, committed to completion. He went out, and it doesn't say how long he was out. He went out until he found the sheep. The same way with us, we have to be compelled. We have to be moved by compassion, compelled to action, and we have to be committed to completion. Because that's what God has called us to do. He says to reach people and teach people and baptize people. It's pretty simple. That's why we're supposed to be Christian. That's why we're supposed to be here. We're going to answer the question why this is it. We're supposed to go out, reach, teach, and baptize. That's what it says. It's that simple. We can, we can get all caught up in all the other stuff and try to make it more complicated than it is, but I want to break it down real simple this morning because I'm like a sixth grade reading level right here. <laughs> I'm being honest. You ask my kids. I'm, I'm writing sermons talking to my kids. How do you spell intentional? So that's why I know God's using me because there's no way he would pick a dys dyslexic, non-spelling person to be a preacher because all I got to do now is write and I'm writing backwards and getting my letters mixed up and I can't spell worth a hoot so I'm using Google hey talk to me Google that's how I spell really so y'all so if y'all see misspellings out here it's because I Google a lot of stuff and I might be even write down the total wrong word and you're like he's an idiot <laughs> but God uses the dumb things to confound the wise right so so he was, we have to be committed to completion. There's two things I wanted to look at here that he, that he did. He stayed out until he found. And then here's the one that I want to think about for us as Christians. He picked up the sheep. And he put it on his shoulders. And he carried it back. Now, I want you to get that picture a minute when we're talking about reaching out to lost people. That picture that he's trying to give to us is, hey, it's not about going out and pointing a finger and you're wrong and you did and you try to change. But there was, a, there was an intentional 
I'm going to get down to your level. And if you can't make it back, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to put you on my shoulders and I'm going to carry you back. Now that's love. And that's being committed to completion. And here's the last one, and this is my favorite. That shepherd was ready to celebrate. He was ready to celebrate. Yeah, I don't think he was eating lamb, though. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe that's why he was excited about finding the lost one, because he was planning on having a party, and he was going to be short a few lamb chops. No. In every one of these stories... The lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. When the lost thing was found, they threw a party. And here's the funny thing, guys, that I want us to remember. Because we like to laugh, we like to joke, we like to pick, we like to have fun. Guess who created all that? God. God likes to party. Have you ever heard that from the pulpit? I'm here to tell you this morning that God likes to throw parties. And there's nothing wrong with us having a party if it's in the right way and for the right reason. Right? Because God created laughter. He created fun. He created enjoyment. We, I think the church for many years forgot about that. Y'all know we can have fun? Y'all know we could dance and sing and jump up and down and throw a party and, and do all those things because God created it? God has, he says he's going to throw the biggest party. The biggest celebrations that they have in heaven are when the one lowly lost thing is found. Now, where does that translate to us? What are our, what, what, what is our... Um, what is our focus on? Are we caught up in the wrong focus? Are we thinking about the wrong things? Are we counting the wrong numbers? Because God says, this is my math. The one matters. And when that one's found, we celebrate. And this is why I came. This is why I talk to the sinners and the tax collectors and all the ones that everybody says I shouldn't be hanging out with. This is why I invest my time and my energy. This is why I spilt every drop of my blood. And as Christ followers, this is why we should Christian. So as in closing, just like last week and what I want to try to do every week, is I want to talk about application. Because I believe that if we could just start living what we already know, it would change the world. And I, I could stand up here and not preach another sermon, and if just the people that already go to the church, that already have all the knowledge about God in their head, but they're not doing it, would just start doing it, it would change the world in ways that we couldn't even imagine. So what's more important to me is not the five principles. I'll, I want to repeat them because I think the more simple it is, the easier it is for us to remember. We should be moved by compassion, compelled to action, complete, co committed to completion, uh, ready to celebrate. Is that all of them? I think it was only four. That's easy for you to remember. But what I want you to do is take that and go, how do I use that? tomorrow what do, what can i do tomorrow that will help me love people like jesus did help me go look for the one lonely lost person that that jesus cares about so what can i do uh first thing that we can do for application is we need to start placing value on the things that are valuable to god And he just told us right here what he values more than anything else. 
It's the one that's outside, the one that's different, the one that's lost. So, how do we change our values to match His? It's through prayer. You know what? God uses prayer to change us more than He uses prayer to change people's situations. You want to know that? That's, that's a lot of why prayer is there. So here's, an, here's a thing that you can do to Christian this week. You like my sentence there? Write somebody's name down. That you know needs God. Somebody that you already have a relationship with in your daily activities. Somebody at your work. Somebody at the grocery store that you go every week. Somebody that you know. God already has somebody in your brain right now. Write their name down and start praying for that person specifically. Not just, oh Lord, touch them, bless them. Talk to you next week. No, let's pray specific prayers. Lord, help me be the light that they need to see. Lord, show me what you would like for me to do. Lord, send somebody else into their life that, that also can touch them. There's, there's an intentional thing that you can do. Write somebody's name down and pray for them daily. And watch what God does. The other thing that, that we need to start doing as as ambassadors of Christ, as Christ followers, as Christians, is we have to be the bridge. We have to be the bridge. Now follow me here, people. Nobody else is going to do it. The media is not going to do it. They like tearing people apart and putting people against each other because it's good news. It's good for the ratings. We have to be the bridge between the racist, between the religions, between the different people of this world. We. You. Why? Because that's what Jesus was trying to do. That's what he's trying to get us to do. Because what did he say? Love as you would like to be loved. That's the answer. There's no, no amount of, I want to be careful because I don't want to get people, get people to get mixed up with what I'm trying to say here because there is a place for defending yourself. But an eye for an eye just makes both people blind. And until we can get rid of the hate in us, we can't expect other people to get rid of the hate in them. And you have to be the bridge to this community, to this country, to this state. You're the bridge. You're the difference makers. You're the one he's sending out. I want to pray for a minute. Everybody, let's bow their heads. Father, we're grateful this morning for your word. We're grateful for your passion for those that are lost. We're grateful that you loved us enough to come searching after us, to come looking for us, to come chasing after us. And Lord, we, give, we pray that you would give us the desire this morning to be that to this world, to be your hands and feet, to understand that this is why you came, that you came to love that you came to save, that you came to serve. And that's what you're asking us to be a part of, is loving, finding, and serving. Lord, this morning in this place, we, we know you're here. We felt your presence. Lord, you know our hearts. And you know that we desire to do what you've called us to do. Just give us the courage to step out. Give us the courage to write down a name. Give us the courage to start intentionally looking for the opportunities that you give us to find that one lonely lost person that needs a touch from you. And that's what it's about. And it's about serving like you would serve and loving like you would love. I'm going to give everybody a moment here with your heads bowed, eyes closed. 
you know, we don't want to try to embarrass anybody, but if, if there's, you know, somebody on your heart, if there's, hey, Lord, I've, I've not been focusing on the right things on your heart, just slip your hand up. And you say to God, while I'm praying that person's name or your name, and you say to God, this is what I want to be about. Father, we're just so grateful that you're touching people's hearts in this place. We're grateful that you're leading us to follow you. And Lord, we just pray that your spirit would take us over. Lord, we pray for each of these individual names that that are on people's minds right now, that you would allow us to be the light to those people, that you would allow us to be your love to those people. Lord, this morning, allow us to remember why we are supposed to be like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.